Hey, Floricon, it's Bob Saunders, CPA and financial advisor. I'm happy to be here sharing some financial tips with you today. Today, I'd like to talk to you about a follow-up on the PPP program, now that you all have your loans, about some current events in taxation, and even some guesses about taxation for next year. Everything with PPP in the beginning was so fluid. We were stressing about every piece of it, and everything we stressed about has changed. The program did get better. Uh, we can't take the stress away from what we went through. But the program did get better. The biggest changes were that we went from having eight weeks to incur expenses to 24 weeks. Before we were limited to 25% on non-payroll expenses like rent and utilities. Now that, that goes up to 40% of your loan. There is one funny odd thing. We thought that transportation was an auto expense that we can include as well in the 40%. Turns out only the government could write this. The transportation and transportation of your utilities to your office or your showroom. So like the transportation charge in your electric bill. So basically it's your electric bill, your gas bill, it has nothing to do with transportation. An important part for owners is that, well, we're treated quite frankly as second class citizens. We're not equal to employees. We're obviously below them. And so the total amount allowed for an employee, if they earn over $100,000, is 24.50 seconds of $100,000. For owners, they upped it from eight weeks worth to 2.5 months worth. Completely different formula than employees. But in the past, it was $15,385, which was eight weeks over 52 weeks times $100,000. So it's been up to 2.5 over 12 or two and a half months out of 12 months times $100,000. That amount, however, unlike other employees, includes health insurance, pension, and all those amounts. We're gonna come back to it later, but there's a reason it's important to know how much the officers, the owners, people that earn over five, own over 5% of the companies get to take. It'll have a little more value for you in the end, even if you, you know, your employees' wages well exceed your, your PPP loan. There remains a lot of uncertainty in PPP. The biggest and most important one to all the owners is going to be the taxability of the PPP loan itself. The loans were intended to be tax-free. Congress passed it with the intention that they'll be tax-free. However, the way the law was written, the IRS has determined, okay, we'll let the loan be tax-free but since it's tax-free income, whatever you spend that on isn't deductible. So if I receive a $100,000 PPP loan and have $100,000 of payroll, I can't deduct the payroll expense. So effectively, they've made it so the PPP loan is in fact taxable. And so it's a little play on words, but Congress still wants it to be tax-free. The IRS is still going to tax you on it. The IRS is technically correct, and there are members of Congress and the House and Ways Committee, uh, bipartisan, want to fix it. They have a bill passed to fix it. It's all of two or three sentences, and it's sitting somewhere that no one cares about and hasn't gotten any attention, you know, for political reasons. Um, we may not find out this answer for a very long time. There is an odd twist in what we know today can be free, and this goes back to the owner. If I am a sole proprietor and I have no employees and I borrow $10,000 and I use that $10,000 to pay myself, owners don't take a tax deduction for what they pay themselves. Therefore, I don't have to add that back to my income. So the portion of the forgiveness allocated to owners and partners should be used first because that portion is definitely going to be tax-free while the reimbursement of employees currently has a, a loss of deduction, so it's not tax-free. And so in the application, even if you don't need it, you have to fill up as much as you can for yourself as well, because that portion will definitely be tax-free. A lot of our clients are asking us to begin the process to have their loans forgiven. But the truth is, we charged them, we took a lot of time and stress and charged them, you know, our hourly rates to, to get the loans. 
And we think that a lot of these loans are going to be forgiven with just a one page signature. It's been again proposed by Congress and hundreds of industry groups that any loan of $150,000 or less be forgiven with just a one page signature of the owner saying I spent it properly without actually saying how they spent it. That'll, that'll cover about 95% of the loans and it will take a large burden off of the banks. And again, this has bipartisan supports and, and again, it just hasn't passed. And with the election coming up, we're just not sure it's going to pass. There's so much thought that this is going to happen that as of today, the SBA has not approved a single application for forgiveness. They've received about 80,000 applications so far and haven't acted on one of them. Because of that, most banks don't even want to take your application yet. There are some issues on their side about responsibility that are unresolved as well, and they're waiting for further guidance as well. And so the truth is no one should be applying for forgiveness yet. The good news is there is no deadline for you to apply for forgiveness. Payments need to begin 10 months after your 24 week period ends. And your, your first week doesn't have to start right away. It's your next payroll cycle. And so by example, if you received your PP loan, April 15th, 2020, your 24 week period ends. The earliest would be September 30th. It could be a little later if your payroll cycle was a little later than that, which means your first payment isn't really due on this loan until August 2021. So we have plenty of time for the forgiveness. We are recommending to our clients, because we always recommend preparing your tax returns early so you have the most time to plan. We're, we're, we're recommending that they have their tax returns prepared, but not file them. Because the chances are we're going to hear about, we're guessing, that the PP loan will or will not be really tax free until May or June of next year. And we're trying to avoid amending returns. As a general rule, most small businesses shouldn't be amending returns. There's too much exposure. A human has to look at your return. We like avoiding humans at the IRS. And so if possible, have your return ready, paying the tax on the most conservative way, assume that the loan will, is, is taxable, not tax free, and hopefully before the extended due date of your, of your taxes, we'll find out that the loan is in fact tax free and you can file your return then. Moving on from PPP, there still are more COVID benefits that people should take advantage of. Everyone should look into the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. This is actually on the Department of Labor's website, not the IRS's um, website. We can give out the web address for this. The act reimburses employers that provide their employees with additional paid sick leave under certain cases and reimburses them in full. So you could effectively give your employees money, make them happier, and have it not cost you anything. It's important that there's no double dipping here with PPP. So you can't take a deduction on PPP for paid sick leave because you're not paying for paid sick leave. You get immediately reimbursed by the government and it's a real easy system. It lowers that tax payment that gets made to the IRS for the social security and Medicare withholding, the payroll service in that big lump, but you get reimbursed almost immediately. Two weeks, up to 80 hours of paid sick leave are available at the employee's regular rate. If your employee is unable to work because they're quarantined or experiencing COVID symptoms and seeking a medical diagnosis. That includes if someone traveled to another state and now they can't come in to work for two weeks, you can pay them for those two weeks and get fully reimbursed by the government. This is available through December 31st. Another part of that act is, again, you can get paid for up to two weeks at two thirds of their normal pay rate because they have to take care of somebody that has COVID. That also includes if your child care provider or school is closed. Now, for the most part, Schools are open, but they're remote. It doesn't cover that. But if school is closed or childcare is closed, uh, you can 
paying employer employee for up to 80 hours for this at two thirds our regular pay. And as a matter of fact, if it's an ongoing problem, they can receive that pay for up to 10 weeks at two thirds their regular pay after the two week period if their school is closed or their child care is closed. Um, the rules aren't that complicated. They're pretty easy to follow. Your payroll service can help you. Um, and again, we'll give you the web address, but this is a way to get free money for your employees. I'm gonna share with you Bob's biggest tax tip. Whether you're a business, a person, this is Bob's biggest tax tip of the, that you'll ever get. Your accountant is very busy until October 15th. He's not very busy until after Thanksgiving. You need to meet with your accountant between today and Thanksgiving for a planning session. It's the most valuable thing that we offer. We offer it to all of our clients and not everyone takes us up on it. But there isn't much planning we can do if you wait to give me your information till January or February. It's too late. This is a time where my head is clear. We have a pretty good handle on where you stand for the year. And here's where the ideas flow. L let me throw a few of them out to you. A lot of tax planning ideas really revolve around the timing of when you're going to report income and expenses. And we use that to try to fill up low tax brackets. We have a progressive tax system where, you know, the first amount is taxed at a lower rate and on an incremental basis like stairs, you, you pay tax on the next set of income at a higher level. So if you have room to pay tax at 15%, you should pay more tax. A lot of people think that I'm an accountant and I'm telling people to pay more tax, but yes, eventually you're gonna have that income if you can accelerate and pay tax at 15%. Again, everybody's different, that's why you need to meet with your own accountant, but you should fill that up. So for example, if you had a bad year or maybe you made improvements and have a lot of extra deductions and you have room at the lowest tax brackets, you can do things like convert your retirement account from a traditional account to a Roth pay the tax now and never pay the tax again. Maybe you have annuities that have a lot of built up tax liability or savings bonds that have built up tax liability. This is a good time to extinguish the liability associated with those items at a very low cost. Other things, you know, we have, uh, we just had a new ruling from the IRS. If you make leasehold improvements to your property and you get a deduction for them, but the deduction is over an extended period of time called depreciation. So when the IRS changed this law a couple of years ago, I think it was in uh, two years ago, as a matter of fact, they intended to say that for a leasehold improvement of a retail property, you could depreciate it over 15 years. They made a mistake, it was a clerical mistake, and they said 39 and a half years. They intended to fix it, Almost always we have problems like this and we have what's called the Technical Corrections Act that fixes the things that were written wrong. But I don't know if you know this, but our politicians aren't getting along, so we haven't been able to put through a Technical Corrections Act. So finally, in one of the latest bills signed, they corrected the 39 and a half years and replaced it with 15 years. So if you purchased leasehold improvements two years ago or one year ago, you have to fix the depreciation on that. You have to talk to your accountant about it and say, look, I was depreciating it over 39 years, but I heard I can do it over 15. You can actually catch up this year and claim that depreciation that you should have taken in the past on this year's return. It's a pretty cool way to save money out of nothing. The government also gives you the ability to write things off faster sometimes. And so we, Ironically, this time they call it special depreciation. So in order to encourage people to buy fixed assets, we have special depreciation. Special lets you write off any property with a 15 year life or less in that first year. So there's a chance you could even take all of those improvements and write them off up front. Certainly most of the equipment you buy, instead of depreciating it over seven, 10, 15 years, you could actually depreciate in full in one year. It's a great system to have, and it's one of the best tools we have for timing where income is in one year or another, but thought should be put into it in advance before it's too late. Along with the best advice that I gave, which is meeting with your accountant when they have time. And, and, and really, it's important to do it then. I'm not sure you're aware of this, but accountants aren't known for their winning personalities. If you approach them during this time of year, 
they, they probably have more free time and it probably will be a little less unpleasant for you. Also think about next year. There's been another change in the law where a lot of businesses were required to be on what's called the accrual basis of taxation or accounting rather than a cash basis. So they're reporting income before they receive it. It's when they earn it versus cash basis when they earn it. So one of the changes in the last two years was that they lowered the threshold. So in the past, a lot of businesses had to be accrual and they no longer need to be. So you're actually allowed to change that. So that change can happen starting January 1st of next year, which would really help timing wise your, your tax planning and save money next year. During tax time, quite frankly, we're probably too busy to think about it. Bring it up now. To, to make that change, it's a change in an accounting method. You would file form 3115. So if you don't remember anything else, ask your accountant, you know, was I cash or cruel? Can I file a 3115 and change my method? Is it worth it for me to think about that? I'm going to tell a joke. Why did the accountant cross the road? Well, the answer is because that's what I did last year. And so instead of just repeating everything you did in the past, give it some thought. What type of entity are you? An LLC, sub S, sole proprietor? Is that the best entity for me to be next year? And maybe this is an opportunity to make a change and improve my situation. This impacts everybody differently. And not only that, but every state does it differently. So it's important to talk to your own advisor. The major difference in the two is that as an S Corp, the owner's required to take salary, just like the employees. It's called reasonable compensation. Whereas with an LLC or sole proprietor, you just take a draw, you take your own, your own money. So with an S Corp, you could actually save Social Security and Medicare tax. So let's say, by example, last year my company made $100,000 and I was a sole proprietor. I paid Social Security and Medicare tax on $100,000. It's not unfair. As an S Corp, and by the way, I just looked at Joe Biden's return. This is what he does. Um, Joe Biden earned about $5 million uh, giving speeches. He took $200,000 of that in salary and $4.8 million as S Corp dividends. You only pay Social Security tax on the $200,000 and Medicare tax. You don't pay it on the 4.8 million he took as S Corp distributions. In addition, during Joe Biden and Barack Obama, we put in the Affordable Health Care Act, which created another layer of tax called net investment income tax. This is also exempted from that tax as well. So there could be a significant savings in becoming an S Corp and allocating your profit between reasonable salary and, and, and S Corp dividends. The flip side to that is under uh, Donald Trump, we had a tax law called Section 199A, which basically allows some self-employed people a tax deduction of 20% of their income. So as a sole proprietor, if I made $100,000, I would only have to pay federal tax on 80,000. That's a nice deduction to have. Here we're getting a deduction without spending money. Usually when clients say, is there anything else I can spend a lot of money on to get more deductions, I offer to raise my fees. It doesn't always go over well, but here's a deduction for nothing. So as a S Corp in that example, and you took salary of 40 and S Corp distributions of 60, you only get the deduction on the 60, whereas a sole provider get it on 100. So those are two of the bigger items you have to weigh with your accountant. Where do I benefit more? Saving on Social Security, Medicare, and, and the affordable health care taxes? Or do I save more with um, staying as a sole proprietor? I'm going to go out of sequence for a minute. One of the tax policies of Biden going forward is that he wants to raise the Social Security tax. I'll get to it in a moment, but here's another way around that. And by the way, all we have to do is follow his lead because that's what he did on his uh, last two returns. The majority of his income was S-Corp distributions and not, not, not salary. This is also a great time of year to think about your employees next year. I've always felt you need great products, but you need great employees to tell your customers you have great products and your employees you know, are, are who represent you. 
And if you want responsible employees that do a good job, you've got to treat them responsibly. And so, not a tax tip, but it's something that I run into often. If you want responsible employees, you need to give them a clean bathroom. No responsible employee wants to go to the bathroom and worry about the mop falling on their head or the chemicals all over the place. So it's a treating them respectfully and responsibly. Um, but they also expect responsible benefits. And so this is a good time of year to think about putting in, for example, like a 401k for next year. There was a law passed two years ago that's just starting in 2021 called the SECURE Act. Because of the virus, they're a little behind in putting out all the rules, so we probably need a few months into 2021. But the SECURE Act allows small businesses to group together to have one larger 401k. And what that'll do is it'll, it'll, it should eliminate the administrative costs of running a 401k. We're putting one together for all of our clients. The 401k still has some costs, but um, for small businesses, typically they need to do something called a safe harbor plan. There is socialistic testing involved that the owners can't get a greater benefit than the employees. The way around that is called a safe harbor 401k plan. So if we can eliminate the administrative costs um, through the SECURE Act, the only costs you'll be left with are either a 3% contribution for all eligible employees, or a 4% match on employees that also put away 4%. So if half your employees don't put anything away, you don't put anything away for them. It's sort of like they have to be in it in order to win it. If you're willing to do that, either 3% of everybody or a 4% match, you'll be able to put away for yourself three pieces. First, the employee typical employee salary deferral. It's $19,500 if you're under 50, it's $26,000 if you're over 50, Plus, you get the 4% match for yourself. Plus, you need a little help from an actuary, but you can do what's called an after-tax contribution and immediately convert that to a Roth. Between those three buckets, you can put away between 25 and 50 or $60,000 at a cost of only three or 4% of your employees. And hopefully, you gain value by putting something away for your employees and they should feel they're getting more than a job. You know, there's a future there, you care about them, and there's a retirement for them. Another employee benefit that I find responsible employees want is health insurance. Unfortunately, that becomes hard sometimes, especially after the Affordable Care Act, for small businesses to do. And so, and part of the Affordable Care Act was actually to separate employees from their health care so that or employers from your healthcare that you can get your healthcare on your own without being dependent on and they phrase it a slave to your your employer and so they changed the way employers can reimburse employees for those costs so if you're a small business uh, let me make sure i get the initials right here you can get what's called a q s e h r a qualified small employer health reimbursement account. Basically, if you don't provide health insurance to your employees, you could provide each employee with, you know, and I, I'm sorry, I didn't write down the amount, it's about $400 a month of reimbursement for medical care, ranging from health insurance, dental insurance, um, to their out-of-pockets for whatever policy they have, and that money is tax-free to them, and you're not gonna pay employer payroll taxes or workers' compensation on it. So it's a way to pay employees favorably for them. Again, no tax to them and no added costs for you. You do have to treat everybody the same, but it's a nice way to reward your employees. Maybe do it one year instead of a raise, you know, because it is money for them, but they, they will feel more appreciated by having something like that around. So Q-S-E-H-R-A, Google it. It's a nice plan to have. There's no cost in setting it up. As, as my final topic today, I wanna to talk about what I think taxes are going to be in the future. So we obviously have an election coming up and um, I'll share with you a little bit about each candidate's tax plan. Um, so Donald Trump has had four years to put his tax policy in place and he's achieved most of it. The funny part is he has a very liberal tax policy that if it weren't for so much hatred, Democrats would love it. And quite frankly, a lot of conservatives, like myself, aren't so pleased about it. Since Ronald Reagan, 
every president, Democrat and Republican, have shifted the burden to fewer and fewer people, the people that work hard, that, 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 that create jobs and, and eventually hopefully have some success, pay a larger and larger percent of the tax. And so the, the rank and file, more, about half the people in our country actually don't pay tax. So the liberal argument for saying that that's not a fair statement is that everybody pays payroll taxes. And so even if you earn $10,000, you're paying 7.65% Social Security and Medicare tax. So Donald Trump wants to help that same group that every other president seems to want to help, whether it's to get votes or he means it, um, and provide a break for that group of people that really don't even pay tax to begin with. And he'll do it by eliminating the Social Security and Medicare tax for people that earn under a certain amount. He tried putting this policy in place a couple of months ago, and you may have heard about it, and some people are actually taking advantage of it. From, I think it's October 1st through the end of the year, people that earn under $100,000 a year don't have to pay Social Security and Medicare tax. They do not have to have it come out of their pay. And Donald Trump's intent is to forgive that amount of money. The problem is, he doesn't have the right to forgive it. And he's waiting for it. And he assumed that Congress would pick up from there and Congress would forgive the Social Security and Medicare tax. And so most employers weren't willing to do this because they would be on the hook for the employees should they not repay it. And we don't know when they have to repay it. So he created an idea, he created a deduction, but he unfortunately didn't have the authority to finish it. But this has been his campaign promise from four years ago, and it's what he wants to do going forward. And so for lower income people, typically 75,000 for married, 150, I'm sorry, 75,000 single, 150 married or less, he wants to avoid those people paying into Social Security and Medicare tax. Biden's tax policy. Um, as I said before, every president since Reagan looks for ways to lower our tax rate but it's disingenuous. The reality is each one of them, Dems and Republicans, have raised the amount of tax that most of our clients pay. I mean, granted, we have more successful clients, business owners that work hard and take risk, and we're shifting more and more of the burden to them and pretending that they're paying less tax by having a lower rate. So many people don't pay tax that that's hard to do. During the Obama administration, he started giving away money to people that didn't pay in to begin with because he was trying to help the same group. So under Obama, they put this $1,000 per child credit in. So let's say we do your taxes and because of all the breaks, you pay zero tax. You still get back $1,000 a child. And so you're getting back money that you didn't pay in. Biden has proposed changing that $1,000 credit to 6,000. So if you have two children, and earn $25,000, dollars $50,000 and don't pay any federal income tax, you would get back $12,000. Um, I'm not sure if that has any realistic chance of, of, of passing, but that's one of his major proposals. Another theoretical change that he would like us to make is lose all of our deductions in favor of a credit. This would apply to home mortgage interest, real estate taxes, and 401k deductions. So he's come out and he said, look, someone that earns $30,000 a year and they have deductions, whether it's a 401k or itemized deductions, they're only saving tax at 10 or 15% because they're in the lower brackets. Meanwhile, Warren Buffett, who earns billions of dollars a year, he saves 37% by putting him money away in his 401k. Because in the past, we would take deductions off of our income. So Biden wants to change those from deductions to a credit. So if you put away $10,000 in your 401k, everybody saves $2,500, regardless of your tax bracket. So it's not gonna lower your income, it's gonna lower your tax. There's problems with this. When you go to take the money out of your 401k, you're gonna pay full tax on it. So it doesn't seem fair to do this, but it has a lot of support you know, for everyone to save the same amount for doing the same thing. Another policy of Biden that I touched on before is he wants to shift the Social Security burden to higher income earners away from lower income earners. And so we'll call it a donut hole. That's the expression that's being used. Currently, you pay Social Security tax 
on about the first hundred and thirty or hundred and forty thousand dollars that you earn. It's adjusted for inflation every year. Beyond that, you don't pay Social Security tax. Biden wants to put in place that if you have the nerve to earn four hundred thousand dollars a year, married, he might make it two hundred if you're single, that you start paying Social Security tax again. So the total tax is set is six point two percent. So if you earn five hundred thousand dollars, you could experience a sixty-two hundred dollar increase in tax. For the very high earners, it is a very significant increase. It can cause you to pay over 50% in federal tax alone um, if, if, if that goes through. Now, um, during the George Bush administration, he opened the door for this. Medicare from employees pay used to stop at the same level as Social Security. So you wouldn't pay Medicare tax above $130,000 either. He added drug benefits to Medicare recipients, and to pay for it, he lifted the cap on Medicare costs, so employees pay Medicare on all of their earnings. Eventually, if Biden has his way with, with this donut hole, where you, you pay on the first 130, then you skip, and then you pay again, you know eventually that donut hole is going to get filled in, and everyone's going to pay Social Security and Medicare tax on all of their earnings regardless. We're seeing this happen at the state level with unemployment and disability premiums as well, where they used to pay, every state is different, but they would pay a one or 2% tax on the first 10 or $20,000 of earnings. Here in New Jersey, they made it unlimited for disability insurance and, and kept unemployment the same. You know that next year with all these claims, they're just gonna raise that on, 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 on unemployment as well. So look, they're, they're gonna lower the rate by 0.1% and save us money without telling us that they're increasing the wage base from 30,000 to making it unlimited. No typical politician talk. I hope you enjoyed hearing the updates on PPP, some suggestions for uh, tax tips, and, and Bob's guesses for the future. Keep in mind Bob's biggest tax tip. Meet with your accountant between October 15th and Thanksgiving. It was great speaking with you, and I'll hand it off to Todd Saunders.